whatever. Anyway, I'm going to go and have a drink. That'll be much better than the rest of this week. See ya. Bye. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Oh, look, my chat's working today. That's fantastic. Hello, friends. Hello, Shell. Um, well, what a, what a week. For those of you in Melbourne, lockdown again. It's not, um, it's not something to joke about and it's just something that we have to deal with. And uh, for the rest of you out there who are no longer in lockdown, then enjoy your freedom. <laughs> and I hope that we all get this terrible COVID thing under control um, so that we can all get on with things. But in the meantime, it's beautiful to see you all. I'm imagining all your shiny, happy faces. Uh, I hope you've got your Pinot Noir organised, possibly a decanter, certainly a nice big Pinot glass because I think we deserve this, hey? Right. So, ah, oh, and did you get some snacks? I'll be interested to hear what snacks people are having tonight because uh, I think I gave you some, oh, I think I gave you some good suggestions this week. Um, and please, if there are any requests that you guys have got, things like uh, we did talk yesterday about the idea of maybe mooting the idea of going back to five o'clock. I think probably six o'clock is going to be better for most people going forward because we're all in different places some people are still going to work and commuting home some people are back working from home again and probably ready for a glass of wine at five o'clock and if that's the case by all means please start without me I'll join in at six o'clock <laughs> okie doke well today is a special day because we are going to be having one of our beautiful single vineyard wines you can be, oh, yum, Shell, sounds awesome. Uh, we're going to be drinking the Robinson Vineyard Pinot Noir 2018. There you go, 2018, beautiful. Uh, this wine, I had mushroom soup, good work, Craig, from Jill's recipe, I hope. <laughs> it's a good recipe, it's a good one, although I've tried it. And it never tastes quite as good as when Jill makes it, but I think she has some magic that she does there as well. What I'm going to do is whack this in a decanter quickly because I think it needs a little bit of air. So let's get that bottle open. Gasping. Got my decanter. Woohoo! Got my bottle. Let's see if I can get it in the decanter and not all over the computer and the table. Would be good. I think with a young line, just a, a really quick rough decant you can see the bubbles kind of happening that means we're getting some nice air in there don't be too quick at the end that's a beginner's mistake to try and finish it off quickly and then it goes everywhere I've done that in my time and now it's decanted that's all you need to do you really don't want it to be hanging around in the decanter after you've decanted it then you just want to put it straight in the glass and that's been enough to give that wine a lovely aeration. If you do feel that it's still not opening up, you can give your decanter a bit of a swoosh, but it's not necessary. Okay, cheers, everyone. <laughs> Happy July as well. Happy new financial year. Oh, it's such an exciting week. Um, I think we actually got there last week, but I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't thinking about that then. So it's all happened at once. A little bit of a uh, little bit of eighteen. Robinson Pinot to fortify us. The dogs are even subdued tonight. They've been for a big walk and they're both, they're both at my feet and um, they can't even be bothered to bark at us today. Right, so Robinson Pinot. Now, I'm not really sure what to tell you about, um, about Robinson Pinot. Come by. <laughs> Apart from, uh, you know, uh, you saw the little holding picture. That was a photograph of Hugh Robinson, and maybe one of these days I'll get him in to do a tasting with us. He still has. He came. He and Isabel came out from Scotland uh, in sometime in the 1960s, I think, or possibly early 70s. They both have very strong Scottish accents still, so they're lovely to listen to. Quite hard to understand sometimes, but uh, they grow beautiful grapes. And um, this sign from 2018 I think is looking fantastic. So let's have a little smell, a little taste, and then we'll have a bit more of a talk about it. 
On the nose, this wine always, year in, year out, has a purity and a perfume. Hi, Kate. Lovely to see you. Hello, Sarah, around the corner. Sorry that we're all in separate places again now, but uh, glad to hear that you've all made it. <laughs> um, it's very pure, this wine, and we've had a Robinson Pinot or two already in the previous uh, series. So we kind of know what to expect, but every vintage is different. So I'm still getting the purity of fruit. I'm getting that real kind of red cherry fruit and some floral lift. It's quite tight still. So just giving it a bit of a swirl, letting it open up as we talk is going to do good things. I get in the 2018 just a little bit of really good duck or bacon fat on the nose as well, which sounds a bit weird, but I think it just adds a nice bit of savouriness, a little bit of richness to the wine and um, makes it work really well with food. Let's let's have a sip. I think we deserve it. We've waited this long. It's been a crazy week. Let's have it. Let's have a sip. Mm. Ah. And the troubles just float away. That is such a beautiful palette. This wine for me is all about red rose petals, red cherries, um, and as I said, that little bit of bacon or duck fat just kind of on the edges on the palate it's really crunchy and pure and fresh and delicious and uh and it's just it's just in a really gorgeous place at the moment it's a 2018 we just released it uh queen's birthday weekend so it's very new yes craig i was going to say that little musky confectionery character coming through on the palate is is quite interesting quite nice it's sort of it's sort of like a um Almost a, hi, Sarah. <laughs> Kevin, welcome. Oh, Emily, welcome. Cheers. Good to see you. Good to have you here. Um, there's just this little kind of Turkish delight, musky kind of character to this wine, which we don't get every year with the Robinson Pinot, but in the good years when the wine is young, it has that character, that kind of sweet shop character um dissipates after a few years so if you like that character then i recommend to drink it young if you're having it uh with a little bit of age on it and you might have had a look forward in your in your tasting box and notice that there's a robinson pinot 2010 which is a very special treat for you guys because you know because we're all special here in the virtual world the 2010 robinson pinot that we'll be tasting in week six of this box uh if you can remember from tonight what this tastes like in four weeks' time, I think it's four weeks' time, my maths are not so good on a Thursday night, um, then it'll be really interesting for you to see how they sort of compare and contrast because the Robinson Pinot does really interesting things with age. But when it's young, it's really joyous. It's got, as you say, this little musky. Um, reminds me a bit of a Turkish... Uh, a Turkish market or something. There's some really nice spices and things. Who else is eating duck? Are Sarah and Kate both eating duck or just just Sarah? Yeah, Turkish delight. It works very well. It's a wine that works very well with hard cheeses, so great with cheddar, great with, as I said on their email on Monday, great with manchego, um, also arati, which is a cheese that I haven't talked about, but someone reminded me of it uh, the other week. And also Arati is a sheep's milk, ewe's milk cheese from France, um, from the Basque country, and it's beautiful. Um, it's really, it's kind of salty and and um, firm and delicious. And they traditionally serve it in, uh, in France with preserved cherries, which brings out the, the sweetness of the sheep's milk in the cheese. And as... This Pinot smells and tastes of red cherries. It's it's that lovely it's that lovely um, comparison. You can see Polly's tail in the background now. She's decided she's going to get involved in the conversation. Um, she gets a bit bored when I talk about wine for too long when she's not out running. But uh, oh, she's up on the sofa now, enjoying the fire that Richard made for us. Here we go. There's our fire. You can see. There's Polly. Hi, Polly. <laughs> there's the fire jill's doing some knitting we're getting ourselves all sorted out for a few more weeks of winter lockdown might even learn to knit probably not 
is anyone out there a good knitter? I'm a terrible knitter. I tried to learn and I made a scarf that kind of was about that long and went like this. But I taught myself how to crochet recently and I think crocheting is going to be my um, wool crafty project for this lockdown. I'll, um, I'll challenge myself to create something in crochet and uh, reveal it to you in week six, see if there's anything worth showing you. <laughs> if anyone's got any crafty projects on the go, um, feel free to, uh, to send me a photo. I think this is a beautiful wine to go with cheese, as I said before. It's great with duck. I know I keep going on about party pies and sausage rolls. Don't underestimate them, particularly if you can be bothered to make the sausage rolls yourself with good sausage meat. It can be a fantastic match to a, to a bright red wine like this. But um, just it's just uh, it's a wine that on a night like tonight, and it's not terribly cold on the morning, she goes, hi, Barry. Barry and Margie made it. Hi. <laughs> um, it's a wine that, you know, it does okay um, reasonably cold if you need to warm it up a little bit then that'll help to bring out more of the aromatics so what was I saying about the Robinson Pinot before I started uh, talking about what it smells and tastes like I was talking a little bit about Hugh and Isabel and uh, you know we've talked a lot about sort of single vineyards and why we do it and all that kind of thing and leftover roast duck yeah Polly's pretty cute she knows it too she thinks she's a supermodel um the Robinsons planted their vineyard, and they're about three kilometres to the south of us. They planted their vineyard uh, back in the 1980s, and Hugh and Isabel had their own wine brand for a while. It was called Mornington Estate. Um, they got involved with a bit of a merger and a and a and a, and a growth um, process of a of of um, Dramana Estate, in fact. And, uh, and that business went public, and shareholders got involved. And Hugh, Hugh, I think Hugh and Isabel just kind of felt that they wanted to regain control of their own vineyard, their own business, and they so their their brand went with uh, with the bigger company, and they kept their vineyards and they kept their their beautiful house, uh, which is amazing um, down there. And they now grow some of the most fabulous fruit down here on the Mornington Peninsula. There's they have about 60 uh, acres, give or take, under vine. So obviously we, well, not obviously, but we don't take all their fruit. It would be way too much fruit for us to deal with. But we take a small parcel of Pinot Noir and a small parcel of Chardonnay every year. And some, quite a lot of the rest of the fruit goes to other producers down here on the Mornington Peninsula. I know Stonia buys some. I know that Peringa Estate buys some. So there's a number of people who buy fruit from Hugh and Isabel and make their own wine from it. A few years back, there were a few people actually making single vineyard Robinson Pinot, and we thought it would be a really fun thing to do a Robinson Pinot dinner with all the all the different Robinson Pinots from around the Mornington Peninsula. And in fact, even uh, uh, was it Hardy's? It was one of the big companies that bought some fruit from them, made a Robinson Pinot as well. It was quite it was quite amusing. Anyway, that time has gone. Some of those businesses have moved on and doing different things. Um, oh, Felicity, Mum's a good knitter. Hmm. Well, maybe we should have a knitting and crocheting competition. Let's see how long. Let's see how long the lockdown lasts for. Um, oh, lentil chips. Yeah, lentil chips have got that lovely earthy flavour. They bring out the cherry, but they also bring out the earthiness of the of the pinot. And I think that could be a really nice, a really nice mix. Um, Emily and is it Emily and Kevin or just Emily talking through Kevin's persona? <laughs> anyway, I know what you mean. Uh, Hugh also has an amazing vegetable garden, an amazing orchard. Orchard. I wish I could speak tonight. Um, he's just he's just someone who loves gardening. He grows beautiful things. So we feel very privileged to be able to um, source fruit from him every year. And a lot of the fruit that we get from the Robinson Vineyard goes into our estate. Yeah. Yeah, the Paringa Estate Robinson. So Paringa's still doing a Robinson Vineyard um, wine and it is, it's a very different shaped wine and that's all to do with little winemaking decisions that happen um, along the way. You know, when the fruit's picked is one thing and then also what happens to the, to the, um, to the fruit in the winery. Oh, cool, Emily. Okay, well, I make sure that you save a little bit of wine for Kevin when he's... Um, when he's finished his last meeting. 
The um, So what was I saying? I'm getting myself all tied up in knots. It's just been one of those weeks. So a lot of the fruit that we get from the Robinson Vineyard goes into our estate wine. So the estate Chardonnay, the estate Pinot Noir has quite a lot of Robinson fruit in there as well as McIntyre fruit and for the Pinot Noir garden vineyard fruit, which we talked about the garden vineyard as well. The best fruit from the Robinson Vineyard every year goes into the single vineyard wine. And um, one of the things that we think, hey, Maddie, my niece, my four-year-old niece, I hope you're not drinking Pinot, Maddie. Hello, Grendal and Beck. I hope you're all watching. Lovely to see you guys. Uh, Christy might also be watching because uh, my other sister, because um, we we uh, sent her a bottle to, to Newcastle to, to taste tonight. So, Christy, if you're there, hello, cheers. Welcome back to Newcastle. <laughs> um so yeah so the so the, so the best robinson fruit we think is the one that gives us the most um the most purity as i said the red cherry characters and it's got this really silky voluptuous kind of character to it it's really truffle cheese would be amazing i want to know where you got your truffle cheddar from shell because i think that Good cheese with a bit of truffle in it is just to die for with a young Pinot. It's so delicious. Now, Kate wants to know what bit, what back vintage I'd recommend for a vertical tasting with the Robinson 18. So 18, 18 was a, a vintage that was quite similar. It was quite it was it was a generous vintage. It was a warm but not hot vintage. It was one of those years that we everything works the way we wanted it to work and did what was supposed to happen when it was supposed to happen, if that makes sense. So we had rain when we needed it. We had sunshine when we needed it. It was uh, it was clear and bright and beautiful when the vines were flowering and setting fruit. So we had a really nice growing season, basically. And so we got quite a lot of fruit of very high quality. Um, it was one of the it was one of the first years for ages that we had to uh, actually drop some fruit. Um, before harvest and that's called a green harvest and the reason we do that is that sometimes the vines get overexcited they have it too good early on in the season and they produce more bunches per vine than we would like them to and that sounds in the first instance to be a really good thing because more bunches means more wine means more bottles means more more wine to sell better profit but unfortunately a vine only has so much energy that it can put into ripening grapes. And if it's trying to ripen 20 bunches of grapes rather than 10 bunches of grapes, then those 20 bunches of grapes will be maybe half as delicious, half as concentrated, half as good as it would be if the vine only had 10 bunches of grapes to ripen. It's not quite as simple as that, but it's basically that. So in 2018, we had big crops we went through and before Veraison, and Veraison is when the grapes change from green to starting to change colour. It's when the birds start to be able to see the grapes and it's also when the grapes start turning starches into sugars. And so that's when we put the nets on to keep the birds out because the birds can see the grapes and they go, well, we know that those grapes are going to be starting to be sweet now so they come in and eat them. Um, and also... Uh, at Veraison, all of the energy that the vine is sharing amongst the number of bunches sort of gets divvied up. So the idea is that if you do your green harvest just before that starts to happen, then the vines will readjust and they will they'll 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 kind of go hmm, not so not as much fruit to ripen. So we'll just put more energy into each berry that we've got left. Uh, so um, in 2018, we did a green harvest. So we got actually the perfect amount of fruit that we wanted because of that and we had a beautiful um a beautiful season and it was it was nice and even got a little bit warm around vintage time so we were in our t-shirts and our shorts but it wasn't too hot uh and really it's a it was a beautiful vintage all out which is why we've got a wine that is so pure fruited and so focused and so delicious because it it is an easiness to the wine which relates to the relative easiness of the vintage. I would compare it to something like the 2016 vintage was similar. 2010 was a little bit warmer, so the fruit characters were a little bit um, darker, but 2010 would be a good vintage to compare it to, and we're going to do that in a few weeks' time. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it's every vintage is a little bit different. If you were going to compare it to a very different vintage, then 2008 and, two, 2008 and 2012 were really good vintages to compare to each other because they were kind of cooler, more restrained vintages, um, more structured when they were young and have developed more perfume as they, they've aged. Craig, with the oak regime, we keep things really simple these days. Uh, 20 to 25% oak on all of our wines. Um, and this wine had about 20% oak, so new oak. So when we're talking about oak, when we want, when we, when we want to talk about the flavour of oak being added to the wine, we talk about new oak barrels because once the barrels are one year old, then they have much reduced flavour to give to the wine and by the time they're two years old, they don't give any flavour uh, at all um, to the wine. Um, but uh, Pinot does spend about 12 to 13 months in oak barrels, all of the wine, but as I say, 80% of those oak barrels are older oak barrels, so they don't give any oak flavour. They just allow the wine to breathe a little bit, um, which softens the tannins and softens the mouthfeel a bit. So um, when people ask about oak, I assume they're usually asking about new oak, 20%. Uh, truffle cheddar. Ooh. Truffle manchego. Oh, at the South London market. Oh, Shell, I used to live in Middle Park. When I was younger and I used to go to the South Melbourne market every week and I love the South Melbourne market. I don't get there very often anymore. So that's a little bit sad. Anyway, there's nice cheese. Actually, that's a good opportunity for me to, to, um, to remind you that if you're in lockdown and you don't feel like going out, um, there's quite a few people out there now offering cheese packs that they will send to you um i know that bruni island cheeses in tasmania does uh there's a new there's a group um the revel group who uh who do um who organize in normal years the pinot palooza tastings and i think they also did game of Thrones. i don't know if those names ring any bells for anyone but basically they're kind of cool groovy wine tastings for cool groovy young people with music and Pinot for Pinot Palooza. Anyway, they haven't been able to do any of those this year, but they also run a cheese festival called Mold and they had all of their cheese producers making lots of cheese for their festival and a few others and then everything got shut down. So they've actually started a cheese club. So you could look that up um, under Mold. They do a different box every month, which is quite fun. Bruni Island's fantastic. It's quite an expensive way to buy cheese, but you don't have to leave the house. So it just depends on what your priorities are. Bruni Island actually are doing terrific sort of mixed packs with some pasta and some cheese and some maybe some smoked salmon. So they're helping out some of their neighbours and that kind of thing, which is really fun. Um, Barry would like me to talk about tannin and age of wine. And there was something else that I think I missed. Uh, Kate, I hope I answered your question about back vintages. Um, 15 you could also um, compare this to or 2006 was also a really nice vintage. But the, the problem with comparing back that far is that the wine that we're making today is much better than the Pinot that we made in 2006 and we didn't make a Robinson Pinot back in 2006 anyway. So uh, leading you astray there. So Barry, Tannin. Um, the way we make Pinot Noir at Muraduck is um, very much uh, sort of old-fashioned, old old-world Pinot Noir winemaking. And what I mean by that is that we like to work the skins with the juice quite hard. Um, in Australia, as the climate's getting warmer and we're getting more sunshine over the ripening period in summer, we're getting, in a lot of regions, Pinot grapes that have quite thick skins because more sunshine, the grapes actually grow thicker skins to protect themselves from the sun. And... In some regions, if you make Pinot the way that they make it in Burgundy and using the techniques that we're using and other regions that are cool um, can use, you tend to pull too much tannin out of the skins and lose some of the delicacy and what we term as pinosity. James, 06 Cabernet, absolutely. I was thinking actually that we might see if we can find some Cabernet that's worth tasting for the next tasting box, but... Uh, that's getting ahead of ourselves. We may may or may not want to do that. 
votes, please. <laughs> um, I think the tannins here uh, are very fine but firm. So there's a silkiness to them, but there's a lot of there's quite a lot of tannin here, Barry, for for um, for a Pinot Noir. It's quite structured. And that's because it's a young wine and it's because we've plunged the cap twice a day during active fermentation and we let the wine have a pre-fermentation and a post-fermentation maceration. So the skins are soaked in grape juice at the beginning of, this, of the process and in wine at the end of the process. And they spend about, this wine spent about 19 days on skins in total, which is if you're mixing it up, then you're keeping the skins wet, but you're keeping the skins in contact with the wine and the wine is pulling more tannin, more colour and more flavours and, and phenolics out of the skins into the wine. So I really love the tannin structure of this wine and we're not afraid of tannin at Muradak. In fact, if we're not drinking Pinot Noir, we're often drinking um, something a tannin, which has high tannin content as well. Um, we like a bit of tannin, but the tannin has to be fine. It has to be really well handled and it pulls all that sweet fruit together. This wine will age, Barry, for at least 10 years. I will, I will make a guesstimate that it will go probably for a lot longer than 10 years because it's under a screw cap, which will slow the aging process down. It's a beautifully put together wine. It's got fantastic acid tannin fruit balance. It's looking really tight at the moment. It will change, obviously, with the age. But, you know, as I said before, the wine we made 10 years ago is not as good as the wine that we're making today. Whether that means that the wine we're making today will age for longer and better than the wine that we made 10 years ago or whether it's just going to be more delicious during that same similar ageing process, I'm not going to be able to tell you the answer to that for another 10 years. So... If we keep doing these tastings for another 10 years, we can come back and talk about it. Craig, the Muradak Nebbiolo is uh, some, <laughs> some way off. Um, we, I think I told you, I think I told you in one of our previous tastings that we, um, that we put uh, eight Nebbiolo vines in the ground in the vineyard about three years ago. We still haven't got any fruit from them, so we're not sure whether Nebbiolo can actually set fruit grow fruit, ripen fruit in this climate. And most of the experts we've spoken to have suggested not, but, you know, they told Dad not to grow Pinot Noir in the early 80s as well, and that was a big mistake. Well, telling him not to was a big mistake and saying it wasn't going to work was also wrong. So who knows? Dad's also quite interested in Blau Frankish after a trip that we took to Austria last year. So watch this space. Um, Barry, I'm glad that that answered your question. Uh, <laughs> this is not a Nebbiolo cake, please, 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 please um, just relax, everyone. If we ever make a Nebbiolo here, it's at least 10 years away. So we're just going to have to stay together for that long and then that'll be awesome. Um, it will be really nice to see the 2010 Robinson Pinot in a few weeks. Uh, We'll work our way through different vintages of Robinson Pinot and other Pinots and Chardonnays and Pinot Gris. Um, we have next week uh, Pinot Gris on Skins 2019 coming up, which is the new release of Pinot Gris on Skins. So we had the 18 a few weeks ago. We're going to be tasting the 19 next week. We all love a Nebbiolo. It's just such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful grape variety. Um, so, yeah, maybe one day one day there will be a Muradak Nebbiolo, but, yes, as I say, some time off, many years away. Uh, but good things come to those who wait. <laughs> I will also mention, um, because I, it, sort of, uh, it sort of affects you guys, it doesn't have to at all, but in a couple of weeks' time, I think it's a couple of weeks' time, I, I put it in the newsletter on Monday, I'm doing a, another tasting later in the evening on the Thursday um, with the guys from Rinky Dink, uh, Virtual Vino. Uh, it's going to be three Muradak Pinots. Um, they're all wines, actually, that we've tasted together, I believe, but we haven't compared the three of them to each other. It's going to be a Zoom tasting, so it'll be a slightly different format. Um, so if you're interested in uh, accessing that, um, the guys are taking all the orders and all, organising it all. I'm just going to turn up and talk on the on the night. 
their, their plan is to turn it into more like a sort of a, a bit of a TV show. So they've got some clips of us talking and walking in the vineyard and, that, and photos and things like that. If you're interested in doing that, awesome. I'd love some feedback for people. Um, yes, Craig. So I'd love some feedback from people about whether you guys would like your regular tasting still to happen at 6 o'clock because if you do, I'm absolutely committed to you guys first. But if everyone's going to jump on the rinky-dink tasting and we're all going to have four wines to taste rather than three, maybe we should think about postponing the tasting that night. So um, unless I hear huge, uh, huge noise from you guys about that you're going to do the rinky-dink tasting and you don't want to join me earlier, then I'll assume that we're going ahead with our tasting as scheduled. So if you want to go ahead with the uh, with the schedule, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Kay. <laughs> um, but, yes, my plan is to go ahead with our tasting as scheduled. I'll have to uh, try and keep myself nice for the evening. They're not starting till 8.30, so that's almost my bedtime, so that's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll we'll be right we'll be right um anyway uh lovely to see you guys all again this week um I think I'm going to leave it at that uh it's been awesome thank you for brightening my day and my week because it really does I really I love I look forward to these sessions and um it's amazing how much joy um some typed messages and a little a little chat to myself in the mirror gives me that could have uh that could <laughs> have something to say about me but no I really feel like we're almost I feel like we're all in the room together it's been it's been it's it's terrific and I hope that we can continue doing this please stay safe um if you're in Melbourne metro Melbourne which includes the Mornington Peninsula um stay home let's get this done six weeks is not going to be well it's going to be crap but it also doesn't have to be that hard Take care. I'll see you all again next week. Courage, mes amis, and cheers. Thanks, everyone. James, I will say hello to Christy and Beck. In fact, Beck might even be watching. Beck, uh, if you and Gwendal and Maddie are watching, um, James Brown is on the tasting with us. You'll have seen his comments. Um, oh, yeah, Maddie, I love you too. <laughs> Can we see the dogs? Okay, this is for my niece. My niece, Maddie, has asked to see the dogs. There's Polly. She's asleep. Say bye-bye, Polly. And there's Frody. He's also asleep on the floor. All right. That's enough. That's enough time. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.